Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. And you know, uh, uh, Professor Clark Barrett, who is my collaborator on this project. Clark and I, we are going to talk about how to achieve dramatic improvements in uh, validation and debug for system on chips. And uh, the scheme that we will be using is called QED and symbolic QED. Now, uh, it's a loaded term. QED really stands for quick error detection. That's what I'm going to talk about. But we have another motive, which is once you, know, you use this QED technique to uh, validate your chips, you would say, well, you know, this chip works. End of proof QED, right? So, uh, uh, so um, of course, you know, uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm presenting the work. But uh, all this work has been done by the students and the collaborators. So they deserve the credit. You know, we are just here uh, to present their work. So we know that there is an explosive growth in our dependency on electronic systems. You know, I was at a meeting of the National Academy uh, you know, like last year. And they were talking about these you know, societal uh, scale problems, right? You know, water, world hunger, education, and all that. And everybody said that the only way to solve that pro those problems is through information technology, right? And that's something that I felt very proud of because I work in that space. But guess what? When you're going to plant electronics inside your body to monitor and actuate and do all sorts of things, you do not want that thing to just crash, right? Which means that if we really have to achieve that, we must ensure robust operation, right? Now, if you look at chips today, on the other hand, there is a staggering complexity of integrated circuits. It's no longer just you know, talking about some processors and that's it. This is an SOC or a system on a chip. And you see that it has a whole bunch of stuff. It has a bunch of processors. It has accelerators like GPUs and DSPs and so on. It has mixed signal components. And it has a whole bunch of other components that Intel, if you were from Intel, you would call it the uncore, which means everything that's outside the core. And that would be like power management, memory controllers, network controllers, you name it. So that's the beast that you know, we must make sure that it works, right? And guess what? What's really going on in industry is that uh, you can have all sorts of new architectural features that you can think about, right? If you are an architect, you can have all sorts of new designs that you can think about to solve the energy efficiency problem, to improve performance, and so on and so forth. The only trouble is that you won't be able to verify that whether your techniques actually work. And as a result, it won't see the light of the day. So here is a quote from uh, my friend Ian Young. Uh, he's a senior fellow at Intel. And he said that new architectural features are limited by validation. And if you thought this was bad, look at this chart. So this is a very simplified cartoon uh, picture of you know, uh, how chips are built. So you do a design, and while you design, you write the Verilog or something, and then you do what is called pre-silicon verification to just make sure that this uh, design doesn't have bugs. Oops. There you go. No, we don't want to install. OK. <laughs> and then uh, you send the chips to be built by the foundry. And <laughs> oh my goodness. OK, postpone. Sorry. OK, good. OK, so uh, the chips are built by the foundry. And the chips come back from the foundry. You, know, you do a little you know, post-silicon validation and bring up. And then you, know, you have high volume of chips that you know, go out to the customers. Now, guess what? This is a chart from Intel. And I often joke that how do you tell that a chart is from Intel when there are no numbers on, you know, uh, on any of the axes, right? But if you look at the number of bugs that escape during design and show up during, uh, during post-silicon validation, that's shooting up. And that knee of this curve that you see, that was sort of around the time that you know, uh, multi-core chips were introduced. So you can see the massive complexity over here. So clearly, the pre-silicon verification that we do today is inadequate. And if you thought that was bad, I think things are going to get much worse. And that's because the chips and systems that we build today, they are facing some major obstacles, many worlds simultaneously. 
All of you know about the power wall, right? That's why you cannot go to Fry's Electronics and buy a 10 gigahertz microprocessor. Now, why is that important, you know, in this context of complexity? This is a reason. The reason that you cannot go and buy a 10 gigahertz microprocessor, that has to do with fundamental physics, which is called the Denard scaling of, uh, you know, transistors. But now, when the transistors are not getting better from an energy efficiency standpoint, but my mom wants a better computer, a better cell phone, which means that the world needs high performance systems. The only way to get performance, and by performance I just don't mean speed, I mean energy efficiency and all that. The only way to achieve performance when the technology is not getting better is by embracing a lot of complexity. And that's exactly what's happening today and that's why you are seeing uh, these accelerators, these multiple cores, you know, power management, thermal management and you name it. And as a result of this massive complexity, this verification and the problem of bugs gets very significantly difficult, okay? So what do we do about it? Well, you know, what does the industry do today? Well, you know, so when these chips you got back from the foundry, what would you do? Well, you know, you plug into the system and I literally know of companies that play games on these systems because games sometimes tend to expose bugs that you would not otherwise find, right? And if you are lucky, you are going to see that blue screen of death. If you are not, not, not lucky, your customers are going to see that. And just consider yourself, you know, st sitting in front of that blue screen, staring at it, and trying to find out that which one of the billions of transistors that are there inside that chip just caused a little error in which ones of the trillions or quadrillions of cycles that thing was running, so that you can actually go and tell, you know, which part of the chip is not working, and, you know, that's called localization. And then you have to root cause and fix your problem, and it keeps going on and on. And if you look at the numbers from industry, you will find that it takes weeks or months of manual work per bug, right? So that's crazy. So why is that so? The reason is that the existing techniques are completely ad hoc. Now, for those of you that are wondering, you know, what this is, uh, this, 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 this picture was shared by my friend, you know, Jason Stinson, who used to be at Intel, and he used to do a lot of this validation stuff. He used to be a very senior guy, and, you know, but essentially what's going on, this is a very high-end validation system. What's happening is that you actually cannot see the chip, which is sort of sitting somewhere over here, right? You cannot see it. Now, uh, who can tell me what these windows are? You can see those windows, you know, over uh, there in the picture. There's, some, there's data collection behind them. Yeah, those are logic analyzers, basically, right? And all these things that you are seeing, these are actually cables that are connecting the, uh, the pins of the chip uh, into those logic analyzers with the hope that somebody will, you know, like collect all this information and be able to figure out what the heck is going wrong, you know, with that chip, right? You know, what caused that blue screen? So essentially, clearly this is not a scalable way of doing things. And as a result, uh, the post-silicon costs are rising faster than the design cost. Yes? This isn't in a system of this sort, with this complexity, that much hardware and so forth, is this being tested at real time, or is it necessary to slow down the main processor clock because of the propagation so delays to the logic analyzers in back? The, the, the answer is all of the above, right? Because first they would run real time, but then when they will find that uh, that there would be there would be a problem, for example, there is a hang. I will show you some you know real examples very soon. Then what do you do? You know, that's when you try to slow down, you try to deconfigure and all that. But guess what? A lot of these bugs are what software guys would call Heisen bugs. Because once you have slowed something down or deconfigured something, the bug is gone, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nightmare, you know, to deal with. I will, I will show some actual examples uh, of that. The uh, picture's actually sorry. missing half the cables coming out of the logic analyzer. An there seems to be an equal number of Ethernet cables going somewhere. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's right, you know. So it's Intel, you know. <laughs> to the cloud, you know. <laughs> okay. And if you thought that was a problem at the chip level and the chip guys have to deal with it, here is actually a plot from Cisco. So what does Cisco do? So they either build their own ASICs or they buy ASICs from other vendors and they build large systems, right? And when their customers complain that some system is not working, well, the first thing they have to do is to find out which chip is not working, right, before they can go and do anything else. And you don't have to really read these histograms. Bottom line, what it is saying is that up to 60% of the situations 
they end up identifying the incorrect chip to be the bad chip. Forget about trying to even figure out what in the world is going wrong. So the problem, this problem gets even magnified at the system level, okay? So what do we do about it? So, you know, so we sort of have to solve this problem. So I always tell my students, I say that, you know, like, so this problem looks like an impossible problem and why would, you know, somebody in academia try to solve an impossible problem? Some sort of sounds like an industrial problem and so on. So I always tell my students that when there is a problem which looks impossible, that means that we really do not understand what the problem is, right? So we have to really understand what is the real problem here. And we have figured out what the real problem is. And I believe, and I have enough evidence by now to prove to you that the real problem is the following. What's really going on is that, so when you play that game or run that test or whatever that is, so what is a bug? A bug is a goblin sitting inside the chip, right? And at some point in time, the goblin triggers. So when the bug is triggered, what does it do? Well, some flip-flop somewhere inside the design, by the way, designs have millions of flip-flops, okay? So some flip-flop somewhere inside the design captured a zero instead of a one or a one instead of a zero, right? If it was supposed to contain zero, now it contains a one. Now, you do not know that that one became a zero or a zero became a one, right? But uh, when that crash happened, that's when you figured out that there was some kind of an incorrect operation that was going on inside the chip. That's why that crash happened or some hang happened or something, right? So what the goblin really did was that he, the real error occurred somewhere over here, right? But you know about it over here. Now, if that time difference was very short, let's say it was only 10 clock cycles, then, you know, you could do something, right? You know, you might be able to go and figure out that what was going wrong. But in real life, what happens is this time difference is billions of clock cycles, billions with a B. Now, one billion clock cycle, by the way, is one second, right? So on real world time, it's very short, but it's billions of clock cycles and it's impossible to make a system go back billions of clock cycles to sort of figure out what in the world is going wrong. And that's why you have this whole validation and debugging nightmare, okay? So what I'm going to show in the, in the first part of this presentation is I'm gonna show you a technique called QED and here are the results that I'm going to show that QED is going to find the bugs billion times quicker, billion with a B, which means that if that error detection latency that I was talking about, if that was 10 billion cycles before, now it will be 10 cycles. And I will show you actual hardware data to you know, prove that. Also, what I will show you is that since I find the errors much quicker, billions of, you know, billion X quicker, so the errors will have much fewer chances to get masked. And as a result, I will be finding more bugs. So as a result, my coverage will go up. And since I find these errors a billion times quicker, whatever takes weeks or months of manual work, I can actually accomplish that overnight automatically, which means that nobody you know, has to really do anything manually. The designer can, at the end of the work day, can go home and you know, click a button, and next morning when the designer comes back, you know, the system will be ready to tell you, you know, what kinds of bugs are there in the system and how to fix those bugs and so on and so forth. And it's broadly applicable to, you know, processor cores, ARM core components, firmware, you know, logic bugs, electric, electrical bugs, you name it. Later in this presentation, uh, uh, Professor Clark Barrett is actually going to show you a symbolic version of this approach called symbolic QED. And by doing that, and I'm stealing his thunder so that he should be in this room, he can show you that he can actually run formal verification, formal, okay? Formal verification on a billion transistor SOC, okay, automatically. And as a result, this approach is not only just useful for post-silicon validation, but it can find a huge chunk of bugs during pre-silicon verification as well. So that's what he's going to show. You've got firmware on there, but software. I was very careful and the reason I was very careful is I, I'm actually going to show you some data on software too. So we believe that this approach should be applicable to software but I don't have extensive data for you to prove to you that you know like the effectiveness of this technique for software. I'm very careful about what I claim you know um, so that's why I did not write software but you will see that in C programs we, we were able to find bugs using this approach. So you can do it in principle. 
know that in principle I have proof that you can do it, but I have not spent an awful lot of time to really nail that down. Okay, okay. so uh, so uh, let's let's take an, uh, the simplest example of a bug. Why would the error detection latencies be so long? So let's take a multi-core chip, okay? And let's say that you know there are a bunch of cores and so on and so forth, and people will really tell you that oh you know I got a bug. What is your bug? Oh the system deadlocks after a while. That's a bug. But the deadlock is not really a bug, right? Remember that bug is a goblin sitting inside the chip at, at some point in time it changes a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1, right? So what's really happening is the following for this, this is the simplest bug that you can think about, right? So essentially it was a, a, it's a, it's a multi-core chip with a shared memory and then essentially what happens is this core 1, in, you know, uh, there is an instruction which tries to store value A into memory location 1. And you know, uh, since you know that's sort of shared between the two caches, uh, what you try to do is that you try to invalidate the other entry in the other cache of core n, right? Now, because of the bug, what happened is that the invalidation signal gets dropped, right? So you know, core n still has a valid you know value of memory location one, but at some point in time, uh, core n tries to you know perform some operations using memory location one. And then you know it deadlocks. The key point over here is the distance, the time distance is very long, number one. And even more importantly, you know, when core n deadlocks, actually the bug was happening when core one was actually trying to create the, you know, doing, was trying to do the operation. So it's almost impossible to go back and tell, you know, where in the world this problem was coming from. And this is sort of is the simplest situation you know that you can think about. The real situations are much more difficult than this, and and the industry uses a whole bunch of techniques. You know, you know, here's a long list. I don't have to read this thing. Bottom line is, all these techniques that are out there, they have very long error detection latencies. So what do we do? How do we solve this problem? And here comes sort of the high level picture of what QED or quick error detection does. What it does is the following, it takes existing tests that are called, I call them original tests, okay? Like for example, your games, your applications, or people even run, you know, so all sorts of, you know, uh, you know uh, random instructions and so on and so forth. And we pass them through a tool which is called a QED transformation tool, okay? And you know, what are these QED transformations? They're like some, you know, mathematical transformations. I'll give you some examples to give you, give you an intuition uh, very soon. And what comes out of this QED transformations are a whole bunch of tests that we call QED family tests, okay? Now this QED family tests have uh, some very interesting properties. For example, you will be able to prove that the error detection latency will be guaranteed very short, for example. And as I said earlier, because the error detection latency will be uh, very short, the coverage will improve. But even more interestingly, you can do this QED transformations completely in software, which means that, of course, you don't trust me. I'm making all these claims standing here, right? But you can actually try this on your chip today, and you, know, you will be able to see the benefits of this QED transformations. Now, if you're a little bit bold, and if you give me 0.01% of your silicon area, then I can actually do this QED transformations even better. But I know that you won't trust me on day one, and you will just want the software version of the QED rather than this hardware-assisted QED. Okay. So what what does this QED do? So you know uh, what it does is the following. Remember, I take existing tests, and I sort of you know broke down the existing tests into snippets. What are snippets? Just a bunch of lines of code, for example, right? And then you know uh, you have some kind of an error detection latency target. It doesn't really matter. You know you do not you know like even have to worry about those. Uh, we have some intrusiveness constraints. For example, you know, one of the companies that we were working with, they said, boy, you are changing our tests. Make sure that during this kind of, you know, part of the test, we are writing some very specific values into the memory bus, and you better not touch that. Okay, sir, we are not going to touch that, right? You know, we can respect all those constraints. And what comes out of these, you know, uh, uh, QED transformations is what I call TMA which means too many acronyms, right? Which means that you don't really have to read all, through all these acronyms. What you should focus on is the following. You still see that the snippets are still existing, right? Snippet one, you see a snippet one, snippet two, and so on and so forth. And I have added a whole bunch of other stuff that's shown in blue. And you don't have to worry about what those things are. We'll talk about it. But 
the property that will be satisfied is the following. So let's say that snippet one was uh, you know, triggering a bug, for example. I would know that by the beginning of snippet two, with all this blue stuff that I just added, I will be detecting the error that is caused by the bug. So since I know what I'm going to put in in this, you know, this blue stuff, since I'm controlling that, I can control the error detection latency. That sort of is the key idea. Now the question is, you know, what, is, what are all these blue stuff that I add? I will give you some kind of, you know, trivial examples to motivate you. You should not try that at home, but uh, that will give you a sense for what I'm trying to do. Uh, but before getting there, uh, so let me, you know, so this is a, you know, big SOC, for example, and as I said, that SOCs contain a whole bunch of components. It has processor cores, it has uncore components like, you know, cache controllers, memory controllers, and so on, and it has accelerators, for example. So depending on what part of the SOC you are targeting, and essentially we target the entire SOC, there are different kinds of QED transformations for different parts of the SOC. And I, of course, I won't have time to go through all these, you know, transformations in this talk. But to give you a sense for these transformations, I will focus on two transformations. One targeting the processor core, which is called an EDDIV transformation. And later on, I will show you a transformation called the PLC transformation that targets uh, these uncore components, for example. But let's look at what EDDIV transformation is. And EDDI essentially stands for error detection by duplicated instructions. And you know you sort of get the idea of where I'm going, I guess. So, uh, so uh, to to give you a motivation for this EDDIV transformation, so let's take a validation program. As I said, I will show you some pretty trivial examples uh, just to get you a sense for things. You know, if you just try this at home without using this QED stuff, you know, it won't exactly work because there will be you know some issues. But Let's take this transformation, right? You know, so let's take a bunch of code. You know, and I just have picked a bunch of instructions, and if you look at the trace of the instructions, you know, you have a bunch of you know r1 equals to r1 plus five, and so on and so forth. If a bug gets triggered somewhere, you see that you know there is a very long error detection latency before you know that there is a problem, for example, right? So what I will do now is the following. So I will actually divide up the register space of my processor into two halves. Now, if you could not do that for some reason, that's perfectly fine. There are alternative ways to achieving what I'm talking about. But just for the simplest case, let's say that, you know, I have registers R1, R2, and R3, and the other space is R16, R18, and R19. And what I have done is that I have identically initialized this, you know, R1 to R16, R2 to R18, R3 to R19, right? And then, uh, when I run this R1 equals to R1 plus 5, I also run R16 equals to R16 plus 5. Which means, and then, you know, when I run R2 equals to R2 minus 1, I run R18 equals to R18 minus R16, and so on and so forth. Essentially, by doing that, what I'm doing is, on the same hardware, I'm creating these two intertwined, uh, you know, execution sequences, which guarantee that at certain points in time, they should have consistent results. And those checks that are shown in blue over there, whether R1 is equal to R16 and R2 equals to R18, they are making those checks very frequently, okay? So I have, instead of that one test that was running before, I have these two intertwined executions of the same test that are running. And very frequently I'm checking that whether those two executions are consistent with respect to each other or not, right? Aren't they essentially parity bits or parity bits ideas? I do not call it parity. Uh, well, so it, it, it comes from the notion of, you know, Martin, as you know, that I worked on fault-tolerant computing and software, you know, implemented hardware fault-tolerant computing and so on. It comes from there. But why does it work in this uh, space? I'll come to that a little bit later. But yeah, the ideas are coming from that domain, basically, right? So what's really going on over here is that, let's say that the bug uh, was triggered by R1 equals to R1 plus 5, you know, then, you know, R1 equals to R16 you know, that would, you know, uh, catch the error, for example, right? If R16 equals to R16 plus 5 did not exercise the bug in exactly the same way. Everybody agrees with that? Make sense? Okay, good. So at least, you know, uh, you have some initial notion that we might be able to catch this bug very quickly, right? Because I have such fine-grained uh, checks of these intertwined executions. But you're, you're distorting the timing of I'm going to, I'm going to come to that. Okay. Yeah. 
So that's why I said that you know don't try this you know uh, these trivial examples at home, lock, stock, and barrel, because you have to be very careful about certain things. So, so that's the example of you know my error detection latency was very short, right? Now let me tell you that my coverage will improve you know very significantly. Why? So again, let's take a test, and when R1 equals to R1 plus one was running, you know the two got changed to a three, but then what happened was you know at some point in the execution of the program that r1 got a value 0 and guess what a, a whole bunch of people in the in the domain of verification will talk about what are called assertions for example right that's a big buzzword right and let's say somebody had an assertion which is oh check r1 equals to 0 duh you know of course r1 equals to 0 and you know that would be checked and everything would be fine essentially what happened was the error that was created by that bug got masked right now let's take our previous example that we were talking about before, right? So when you run R1 equals to R1 plus 1 and then R18 equals to R18 plus 1 and you do the check, you detect the bug, although the bug would be masked later on. And as a result, with no QED, you would have a bug escape. But with QED, you will have a very quick detection of the bug. Now, I'm absolutely sure all of you are thinking that, gee, you know, this guy is just making all these claims what happens when R1 equals to R1 plus 1 and R18 equals to R18 plus 1 get affected in exactly you know, the same way, then I would not be able to detect the bug. And here comes fault tolerance. So in this world, there are two kinds of bugs, the easy bugs and difficult bugs. The easy bugs are easy. Why are they easy? Because every time you run the test, the bug is going to make the system fail in exactly the same way. This would be, you know, a lot of people would call this bore bugs, basically, right? And if you have a bug that has that kind of a reproducibility, you just need to do a very simple binary search, and you will be exactly be able to tell in logarithmic number of steps where the bug is and why is it failing. Versus, as I said, the badness of the uh, most difficult bugs are is, is that they are like Heisen bugs, which means, you know, uh, they are not reproducible. Now, what we are doing over here is that we are turning that lemon into a lemonade. Why? Because now think about, since you have the same hardware that's running these intertwined executions, when that, our, our, you know, um, when, when that you know, duplicated instruction is running, the state of the system is very different. The contents of all these other flip-flops that are you know, creating the state of the system or the electrical state of the system is very different. As this gentleman was saying, that the timing is very different. And, a result, and, and as a result, these Heisen bugs, what they do is that they create this notion that you do not have the exact same erroneous behavior that are affecting these two instructions. So at a high level, you can think of it this way, that although the bug is happening because there was a logic problem or there was an electrical problem or there was a firmware problem or even there was a software problem, the way that difficult Heisen bug behaves in a system level it looks like as if there was a cosmic ray hit that came and you know like created a little error somewhere and as a result these difficult bugs are automatically detected because of the timing diversity of when you know these bugs are exercised in what way but if you are not happy with that answer actually there are uh, very focused ways of creating diversity between these various executions that are intertwined for example over here you can see that when i run the r1 equals to a plus b you run R18 equals to 5 times A prime plus 5 times B prime, and then you are check at a different space. So what would happen is that if a bug affects even both of these executions, the net effect is not going to be identical, and you will be able to detect the bug. And there is a whole bunch of literature on how to create this diversity. Uh, you know, somebody asked us this question, right, that, you know, for the Intel floating point bug, uh, you know, uh, that happened even before I came to grad school, you know. Uh, that would you find that bug and this diversity would be a perfect way actually to find that bug. Okay, so uh, that was like, you know, one of the examples targeting processor cores. What do we do for the on-core components? For example, the PLC transformation that I promised to show you. Uh, essentially, what I just said is that all these intertwined executions that I was talking about, that would be very good at finding bugs inside the processor cores. But if you look at today's SOCs, a very significant chunk of the SOC, actually the majority of the SOC is outside the processor cores. 
And that's where a lot of bugs happen because people, you know, do not have as much time to integrate all these various components and make sure that everything is actually working right. So as a result, these Encore components are extremely important and they're very prone to very difficult bugs. So we will be using this, uh, another transformation called the PLC transformation uh, to address bugs in those parts of the SOC. So how does the PLC transformation works? Well, before getting there, uh, so you know, I have a design with many cores as shown over here, you know, uh, and then, you know, these were the original tests. The first thing that I would do is that using that EDDIV transformation, I transformed that, you know, the test that now would now be running on this individual processor cores. And then I will be adding this other checks, other transformations on top of that. This would be called the PLC transformations or proactive load and check transformations. What do they do? Essentially, just like what we talked about in the EDDIV, which was like sort of splitting the register space and kind of identically initializing them and making sure that the intertwined executions are sort of, you know, are self-consistent. Now, I will be doing something similar for the memory space, which means that these proactive load and check transformations, every so often from all the threads that are running on all these processor cores, they will be looking at some part of the memory space and they will make sure that the memory contents are consistent with respect to each other. And that's how I have implicitly covered the entire SOC because if some of these Encore components would create trouble with respect to bugs, what would happen is that ultimately some memory location will be messed up. And by doing this proactive load and check transformations very frequently, I will be reducing the error detection latency and improving the coverage with respect to, uh, you know, those bugs as well. So that's good. So, you know, hopefully now you sort of see the bigger picture that, you know, you deal with bugs inside the processor cores, you deal with bugs outside the processor cores. Now, this gentleman has this fantastic question, which is the following, right? He said timing, but let's take a step back. What's really going on is I have some tests that was finding bugs and I have transformed those tests into new tests and, you know, to find more bugs and finding more bugs more quickly. But could you have really intrusiveness, which means the fact that you are transforming an existing test into a new test, can that end up in a situation that you might not find the bug in the first place because something got skewed up in a bad way, right? That's sort of, you know, where you are coming from probably. And what does the bug coverage impact of that would be? So the way we deal with it, so we have two ways to deal with it. One is a software way to deal with it, and I'm going to show you, and that's where this notion of QED family tests come. But then there is actually a hardware way, which is that if you just give me 0.01% of the area, then I can actually play a tiny little bit tweak, and I can almost get rid of this notion of, you know, uh, that I have to change the tests in software. Uh, a lot of these checks will be happening out of that hardware, the 0.01 percent area of the hardware, and a lot of this intrusiveness will be gone. But of course, you are not going to give me this addition, additional silicon area, so it's not worth talking about it, at least in this presentation, so I will tell you how I do it in software only. So what I essentially do is, there is a trade-off between this error detection latency and intrusiveness, right? What is a trade-off? Well, of course, my, if my error detection latency is very long, which means I don't even modify my test, then I would not have any intrusiveness. Versus if I go and, you know, sneak in these additional instructions that I was showing you before, every, for each instruction right there, then it would be really intrusive. So essentially, I have to find a balance between error detection latency and this intrusiveness. So what we do is that, as you can see over here, that we actually change the snippets. So what we do is that we window it. We say, well, you know, for, from each test, you create a family of tests. And in each family of, in, in each, each member of that family, you know, you have a certain window uh, where you actually go and do the uh, transformation or to be precise, all the instructions within that window are not affected and then only you add your whatever additional instructions you are adding, right? So now you have this window over here, you have a window over here and instructions inside the window are not affected, you know, like for one member in the family. And now what you can do is that you can slide that window and as a result, you can show that at least there will be one member in your family where if a bug got triggered by that sequence of instructions, 
that will be held as it was in the original test and as a result the bug would be found by at least one test in the new family test. And that's how we get around this whole issue about you know, intrusiveness and you know, our uh, hardware results show that uh, that is extremely effective in actually finding bugs. Okay, good. So I talked a lot. At this point what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you some results. And then I'm going to hand it over to Clark who will get into this symbolic version of this QED to show that how you can use it for sort of formal verification of uh, very large SOCs, you know, we are going to show you results for an SOC with half a billion transistors, billion with a B. But before that, let me show you that QED is very effective for electrical bugs. So I was very fortunate that my friends at Intel, they actually brought in an actual core i7 hardware into our lab, okay. And uh, what you can see over here, this blue thing that you can see is actually a debug port, it's a custom debug port, essentially through this port, you can change the voltage and the frequency of that processor at a very fine level. So that's a way to create electrical bugs, right? And then the challenge was, if you ran the original tests, what would be the error detection latency and coverage? And if you ran this new QED tests, what would be the error detection latency and coverage? And as you can see that with this QED, you get six orders of magnitude improvement in error detection latency, a million times real hardware result. So the original tests had error detection latencies of 1 to 10 billion clock cycles versus we have very short error detection latencies and it's no, mo no wonder that we also detect a lot more errors that the original tests would not detect because we are detecting everything so quickly. Now one question you might ask is that hey still you got 0 to 10,000 over here like why is it so? Why isn't it you know, shorter than 10,000? Well guess what? You know since this was one of the first experiments that we were doing. I did not want my student to fiddle around with the x86 binary or the x86 assembly. We said that we will be doing this QED at the C level because this QED technique can be applicable either at the C level, assembly level, binary level, you name it, we can do it. You know, and we have done it you know, for many chips. But so, so if, you, if you instrument this thing at the C level, then there would be some C level library routines that will be stuck in, right? Now if the error got triggered when that library routine was running, you have to get out of that library routine for QED to detect it and that sort of ended up having you know like very few cases with 5,000 and 6,000 cycles of error detection latency. As you can see the overwhelming majority was just a few hundred cycles of error detection latency for this very complex chip you know uh, for you know uh, just using software only techniques. The other question we were asked at that point is that all these errors that we were detecting right we had you know uh, 4x more errors that we detected do those things correspond to actually unique coverage improvement? And the only way to demonstrate that would be through a schmoo plot. For those of you that do not know what a schmoo plot is, it's essentially a frequency versus voltage plot. So if you reduce the voltage a lot, this chip should not work, right? Because at a very high frequency, right? Uh, so the reds are bad, the greens means things have passed. But if you look at this particular voltage frequency point, of course I cannot tell you what that numbers are. Uh, you know, uh, what you will see is that if you ran the original test, it would be green. But if you ran the QED test, it would detect error, which means that it's a unique detection. And by the way, since QED programs are absolutely valid programs, it's not like bringing, you're bringing the processor to some illegal state and you are detecting something illegal basically. You are actually, it's a real detection, it's a true uh, coverage improvement. Uh, well, was this the only hardware, you know, like no? You know, like the, my Intel friends also brought in what Intel would call a single chip cloud computer, I think. It was a 48 core chip. You don't have to read through everything on this slide. Bottom line is the results are exactly similar as I was showing before. Does this mean that this technique works only for electrical bugs? No, you know, we, it also works for logic bugs. Uh, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. So here was uh, hardware that, you know, we were challenged in, a, it's an SOC from Freescale. And what happened over here is that I was telling you, right, they were running it for uh, 15 billion clock cycles after 15 seconds of operation. Uh, what essentially happened, after 10 seconds of operation, this was 1.5 gigahertz, uh, this chip would hang. This chip would hang, but there would not be any observable failure. So how would you go and tell, you know, what's, where, where is the bug? It took them several months to figure out, you know, where the bug was. So we were challenged, you know, 
what we did simply was we took their original test whatever it was running and it was in binary so we did not, we did not even know what the test was doing okay. We just passed it through this QED you know trick that I just showed you and it took us a few seconds to exactly tell that a sequence of eight instructions that was actually causing the problem and you have to find the problem so 8 plus 1 is 9. So as you can see that with nine, within 9 cycles you could exactly tell where the bug is from that 15 billion and in a few seconds compared to several months. Okay? So it works for logic bugs. What about other logic bugs? Well, I was very fortunate that all these companies that are shown over here, they gave me access to their actual bug databases where we found uh, lots of very difficult bugs. And uh, one thing that we did is that we abstracted these bugs into uh, something what I call bug benchmarks so that the community, the academic community can actually use these bug benchmarks to validate their verification techniques. With the lack of that, you are caught in a rut. Uh, bottom line is, again, over and over again, you will see that if you run existing ways of doing things, you have very long error detection latencies. With QED, you very significantly improve error detection latencies and you improve coverage. Uh, this was an industrial test by a company. You can see they were very proud of their test. You can see that 10 billion cycles of error detection latencies versus QED finds it very quickly and it finds unique bugs that they couldn't have found. And it goes over and over and on and on and on, you know, like power management bugs, you name it, uh, you know, firmware bugs, same story, I'm not going to go through the details. Is QED useful for hardware accelerators because aren't we using software and if you had a hardware accelerator which is sort of, you know, uh, you know, shielded from the software, how would you, you know, do QED on that? I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, there is a paper uh, that, you know, uh, talks about this thing. The only point that I would like to mention is how do people design accelerators? They take a C level design or C++ design or domain specific language design and they pass it through high level synthesis to create hardware accelerators. So when we did this work, my challenge to the students was, well, then we should find bugs in the C code, right? Because that, those are the real bugs. And guess what? We found unique bugs in the C level design, in the C code corresponding to those designs that people didn't know about. And whoever maintains the C level designs, they confirmed with us that those were real bugs that were not found. So as I said that you can find bugs in software, but we didn't do a very extensive study with you know, commercial software. That's why I did not make the claim earlier. But we have some inklings that it might work for software too. So now the question. Uh, well, that's what, you know, uh, with, with, with the symbolic QED technique that, you know, uh, Clark is going to talk about, that's where that comes in. So the question really is at this point that now that we have reduced the error detection latencies and, you know, we have improved coverage, how do we really go from, you know, months to overnight automatically, which means that now once I have detected the bug very quickly, I should be able to localize the bug automatically without the designer intervention. And what does localization mean? It means that I should be able to tell where in the big you know, chip, a tiny piece of hardware where the bug resides, and what is the nature of the bug, which means that some kind of a very short trace that would expose the bug, right? If it was, a, for example, a logic bug or something. And here is what you know, Clark is going to show. So with this symbolic QED technique, uh, he's going to show results, as I said, on a half a billion transistor SOC. So traditionally, it would take weeks or months but the symbolic QED will be able to do this job within 20 minutes to 5 hours, depending on the size of the design blocks and so on. Traditionally, it's manual. Symbolic QED will do it automatically. And finally, traditionally, you would have this really long bug traces that you have to look at to find out where exactly the bug is, what's causing the bug, versus symbolic QED will give you very short traces, very succinct traces to nail down the bug. Uh, I would stop at this point, take any questions, and then hand it over to Clark. Yes. So a bit earlier you mentioned that uh, you were mostly just going to be talking about software implementations of QED, but then you alluded to there being some hardware. Yes, there are some uh, hardware enhancements, which I did not talk about. But I'll be, if you are interested, send me an email. I'll be very glad to sit down with you and chat about it. The point is the hardware overhead of adding that stuff is extremely small. And actually, you can reuse some of the... For example, memory built-in self-test controllers that you already have inside your chip, you can reuse some of that to do the hardware version. And then, second yeah. question. Uh, when you were just uh, talking about high-level synthesis-based accelerators, are you saying like 
uh, what, what type of accelerators? So we looked at a whole bunch of accelerators, for example, signal processing accelerators, uh, you know, and I think some cryptographic stuff. Most accelerators that people would use, yeah. And what we used is, you know, like a whole bunch of benchmarks that, you know, people, ha the academic community uses. You had a question. Yes, yeah, so you're getting like faster detection by adding these sequences in that are likely to trigger things. Have you compared it to, or did the cases that are already, the industrial cases already include things like delta debugging like algorithms, like test case reduction? And how yes, so, things? you know, we looked at a whole bunch of uh, industrial uh, examples, and uh, all of them have very long error detection latencies. That's the trouble, you know, because most of the, for example, you know, the simplest example of this delta kind of stuff would be like to, you know, put in a lot of assertions, for example, between various points or to have checkpointing, for example, to go back to a state, you know, like, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and all of them have long error detection latencies. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to say, like, yeah, in software, a lot of the time what you would do is instead of, like, adding more checkpoints or something, you would just say, you know, like, delta debug and like, cut the program in half and do this app and then do that. Right, so that's what I was meaning by binary search, basically. And those are very good at finding bore bugs that reproduce themselves very well. But when you have a Heisen bug, like, a, like you know, like, that, those are the most difficult bugs, basically. It's very hard because next time you will be running those various binary chunks, basically, the effects of the bugs will be gone. You had a question? Yeah. yeah. This automation technique you're doing, you're doing the pre and post techniques together? Yes. You know, so there is actually no difference between pre and post, especially, you know, like what Clark will show you, you will see that the exact same methodology can be used in pre as well. So um, when I first sat down with Subhashish, my expertise is in formal methods, um, and we started looking at uh, you know, this, this QED technique and wondering, can formal help here? Is there something we can do? And so the first observation, of course, is that this, everything you've seen so far is still a testing technique, right? So we take the existing tests, we make them better, but if your original tests can't find the bug, then QED won't find the bug either. So the first idea we had well, is, can we make this more exhaustive? And then I think a nice observation is that all of these, th this whole technique, this QED technique, is based on uh, the observation that if there's a bug in an SOC, the bug is observable by the processor core, right? Because if, the, if it doesn't affect the processor core in any way, it's not a bug. So there's a way to use the core as this sort of magic probe that can probe all of the SOC, and that's a key idea uh, as well. Okay. So, uh, the technique we came up with, symbolic quick error detection, um, has the following properties. Uh, so, it, it is a more exhaustive technique, okay? So, it's going to find bugs that even your test would miss. Um, it's going to do it automatically, so it, it uses an automatic uh, formal engine. And uh, it works for cores as well as uncore and other components. And then, because this is a formal technique, meaning that it runs on a model of the processor, not on the hardware, you can use it both pre and post. Okay, and it makes your engineers happy. <laughs> All right, so we're going to use a technology called bounded model checking. And just to introduce this to you, if you're not unfamiliar with it, the idea is uh, you have a model, a design, uh, some piece of hardware, and then you have to have a property that you want to check, a, ch a property that this piece of hardware should uh, satisfy. And you put these two things into a BMC tool, let it think, and it will automatically give you back a counterexample if one exists. Okay? Now, the technology behind bounded model checking is based on the uh, explosion of, of improvements in Boolean satisfiability and related satisfiability techniques, which are remarkable and continue to improve uh, very quickly. So, so we're leveraging uh, that breakthrough technology. Now to, to show you a little bit more in detail how this works, uh, what you, you can look at your design as you know, a set of flip-flops running through some logic back into the flip-flops. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that sequential design and we're going to unroll it into, an un, into a combinational circuit that represents running that circuit for several cycles. Now, the idea is you would, you would put some constraints on the initial set of flip-flops that would represent the state that you want to start in. You would put some constraints on the inputs that would represent what kinds of inputs are legal. 
And then you would put a check on the final set of flip-flops that would represent the property that you're trying to look for. And then you turn this whole thing into a satisfiability problem, and the satisfiability engine looks for uh, some set of inputs that satisfy the constraints that you've given that would cause the property to be violated. And if there exists such a set of inputs, it will find it. Furthermore, the way you do this typically is you'll unroll it one uh, level at a time and do the check at each level. So you're guaranteed to find the shortest, uh, the shortest distance from the initial state that actually violates the property. So that's one of the, the key properties of bounded model checking is you get these short counterexamples. Okay, now, as you might expect, there are pros and cons to using this kind of technology. So one of the most difficult issues is you have to have this property. Where does the property come from? You know, and typically uh, the way bounded model checking is used in industry is people write manual properties or they have some sort of automatic assertions that get inserted, but a lot of those assertions are probably junk or most of them don't catch bugs and just take up extra space. So this is not, you know, this is a, uh, typically one big uh, bottleneck. The other, th <clears throat> the other thing, uh, the next two, the bounded model checking bound and the design size. So for obviously for larger circuits, you can unroll less. Um, but in any case, you know, there's sort of a limit to how many cycles you can unroll before even the, even today's fast engines uh, get bogged down. Um, and then, of course, the input constraints also need to be specified. Now, that's, that's a, project, a problem that's dual to the property problem. What's very nice about the technique that we have is we, uh, in, in a very nice way, we're able to deal with all of these problems. So I'm going to show you how we deal with the property problem. And basically what we're doing is we're leveraging the QED to come up with a universal property, which I think is very exciting. Um, the other thing is because the QED technique is designed to find bugs fast, we end up only having to unroll a few cycles. Uh, we also have a technique for dealing with large uh, SOCs and part of the properties of QED allow us to uh, partition the SOC in various ways to get around a uh, large design size. And then we have a, uh, a hardware module that's only used during testing. You don't have to put it on your chip. Uh, called a QED module that helps solve the problem of the input constraints. Okay, so the first problem I'm going to look at is the property issue. So you don't know what the bugs you're looking for, so that makes it difficult to write good properties. Uh, you would, you, ideally, you would like to write properties that cover all possible bugs, uh, but this is very difficult. Okay, so the current state of the art is that properties are a big bottleneck. And then the other challenge, like I mentioned, is the size. So to address property one, what, how, how on earth are we going to come up with the universal property? OK, so the key idea is the property that we're going to check is, does there exist any QED test that could fail? OK, so we're going to leverage this idea of the QED test. Um, and we're going to allow it to range over all possible sequences of instructions. So uh, just to remind you uh, what was said earlier, this duplicate and, ch duplicate and check um, technique, uh, it would take a sequence of instructions, duplicate them on a, on a shadow set of registers in memory, and then compare the results. Uh, OK, so we can do this symbolically, right? So rather than saying we're going to pick these three, you know, the instructions from your test, we're going to say, we're going to flip it on its head and say the bounded model checker will now pick from the set of all possible instructions, a sequence of instructions, and then we're going to duplicate that sequence and we're going to check if the result is, is identical. And that whole problem now is symbolic. So it's going to search the space of all possible sequences and duplicate sequences. Okay, now <clears throat> we have to be a little bit careful about the property that we're checking, right? So in QED, the property that we check is that the registers and the shadow registers match. Obviously, um, this isn't going to work unless we are a little bit more careful about what the sequence looks like, right? So you could trivially set the two registers to different values. That's the legal sequence of instructions, and it wouldn't match. So what we have to do is constrain the input sequence to be what we call a QED uh, trace, meaning that it consists of a set of instructions followed by a duplicate set of instructions. And only at that point do we check the result. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, I think I just said that. Uh, in order to do that, uh, now that, that kind of a constraint is a little bit difficult to write, so we're going we're gonna to utilize a piece of hardware to do it, this QED module. So the idea is we add this little QED module to our fetch unit, and what happens is the set of instructions that the bounded model checker chooses then pass through the module, and the module produces two sequences. And this is actually pretty easy to do. All you have to do is decode the instruction, look for the parts of the instructions that deal with either registers or memory, and just move those into the shadow registers and shadow memory when you do the duplicate. Okay, so you basically have just a little state machine. It's going to run a sequence, and then it's going to rerun the same sequence. And the second time, you have the duplicate flag on, and it's just going to make this transformation. Okay, uh, and we've implemented this, and the module is is not it's not difficult to implement. Okay. All right, so how does this work now? Uh, so we have the QED module attached to the processor core. It automatically duplicates the instructions. And it also knows when it's legal to do this comparison, right? Basically, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm not going into all the details, but, you know, you have to be a little bit careful about things like when instructions commit and stuff like this. So it tracks all of that, and it knows when both the original and the duplicate set of instructions are finished and committed and when it's legal to compare the results. Okay, now of course you also have to be careful about the initial state. Remember I said part of setting up a bounded model checking problem is getting the right initial state. And here what we have to do is just ensure that in the initial state the original and shadow copies of everything are the same. Okay, now you could do that symbolically. Uh, what we found is it was good enough just to run some simple simulation, uh, get to what we call a QED consistent state where the the original and shadow memories and registers are the same, then we just extract that state and dump it into the bounded model checker. And it, it, it turned out, you know, in our experiments, what we uh, saw was that it didn't matter too much what test we ran uh, or, you know, at what point we captured the result. Uh, just as long as we had some consistent state, it was, it was able to work. Okay. Now, Remember uh, what Subashi said that we have, that QED has this property of guaranteeing quick detection. What this means is that because, uh, because we have this, this property, uh, we'll be able to find, a, we'll usually be able to find a bug if one exists in a few cycles. And this addresses the issue of, you know, bounded model checking gets worse as you unroll more cycles. Uh, in fact, for the for the results I'll show you later, uh, we were able to find all the bugs in something like less than 10 cycles. So, so there was always some QED test of just a few cycles long that would detect the bug. Okay, now of course you can invent pathological examples where this is not the case. Uh, but, but for real bugs, we believe this is the case. Okay, so what do we have now? So now we have this universal property. We're going to search the space of all QED tests. Um, we have an initial state that's just some QED consistent state. Uh, and then we have our model plus the QED module. And we're going to put all of that together into the bounded model checker. <coughs> okay, so that addresses the first challenge, which is properties, uh, which I think is pretty exciting. So for basically, if you have a chip with a processor, uh, with a core that has instructions, you can apply this technique uh, and you don't have to write properties, right? You can just use the QED property. Now, what about the second challenge, uh, design size? Okay, so the idea we have here is to use something called partial instantiation. Um, because in a multi-core chip, what you typically have is lots of repeated components. And so we don't actually need all of the components in the SOC uh, in order to exercise the functionality. In particular, for example, if there's a bug in the uncore, most likely we can find it with a single core. Worst case, probably two cores. Uh, and some combination of instructions in those two cores will exercise uh, the bug. On the other hand, if we have a bug in the core, we just need a core. We don't need uh, any of the uncore, and so on. So our idea is basically to just partition this up in a bunch of different ways. You know, pick a partition like this. Pick another partition that looks like this, another one looks like this. And we're just going to run all of these different partitions in parallel. And whichever one pops out with the bug first, great, we'll take it. Uh, furthermore, what this allows you to do 
is to localize with respect to uh, the actual location, the module and the design. So for example, if we get two results with a bug trace, <coughs> then we can look at the two and say, aha, this one doesn't need that uh, extra cache bank. We can find it with just a single cache bank. Okay, so now why does this work? Um, basically, uh, there's a key idea here, which is that this technique of using QED tests as a property gives you a very nice compositional property, right? So suppose you were just writing assertions and you wanted to check something about cache coherency. <coughs> you might have a property that says something like, if core one writes a particular line in the cache and core two reads the line, then the, then the line is in the shared state. Okay, so this is a great property. It'll catch that bug. <coughs> but it's not compositional with respect to removing uh, parts of the design. So if I remove core two, now what does this property become? It doesn't make sense. However, the QED checks are compositional because as long as you keep at least one core, you can run instructions on that core. And you can configure your, your system to have as many caches or memory banks and, and basically you just have to have some legal configuration and these things are designed to be plugged together in various ways. So just, you just have to have various legal con configurations and all of them should work, okay? So the, Q the property of QED consistency or checking the QED test works for all of these configurations. So it is compositional. All right, <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, we have our universal property, we have partial instances with the QED modules, and we put all of this together in our bounded model checker tool, and, uh, <clears throat> and you can run this, you know, and within a few hours, uh, you do get uh, these results. Okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, one example, and I'll talk about results. So what does it look like for, for a very specific example? Suppose that we have a bug which, uh, which manifests as follows. Uh, after you load from consecutive cache lines, the next load is corrupted. All right, so what we would do is we would set the, prop the property, so we don't even know what this bug is, right? We're just gonna generally check whether there's any QED test that does something strange. Um, <clears throat> so, Using this particular example, Symbolic QED can find a bug trace with four instructions, two original and two duplicate instructions. And what happens is basically it says we're going to load uh, R1 from a particular memory address, then load R2, and notice that we're loading R2 from a consecutive cache line. Okay, so the bug gets triggered. Now, uh, these two instructions pass through the QED module and, and for the first two instructions, it's just a no-op, right? It's just identity function. Now, we get to the end of the sequence and we send a restart signal. So the PC gets set back to uh, the address of the first instruction and we actually load those two instructions again. But now the QED module is in the duplicate mode and it's gonna transform them by changing the register and the memory to use the duplicate address. Now what's gonna happen <coughs> is the load into R17 is going to get corrupted. That's the, that's the bug, is that the next load after loads from consecutive cache lines is corrupted. Uh, so R17 is not going to match R1. And so when we get to the final state, our QED, our BMC property that the registers and the shadows match will be violated. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so just so to review, these are, this is what we get. Um, and let's look at some results. Okay, so we did a case study using the OpenSpark T2. This is a very large uh, chip. It's got half a billion transistors. And we inserted 92 difficult logic bugs. The, the bugs were taken from various bugs in the database where we had all kinds of different activation criteria, all kinds of different manifestations. Uh, they included bugs in the core, bugs in the uncore, and power management bugs. <clears throat> okay, and the first, the first point to make is that any one of these bugs would be extremely difficult to localize. Uh, 
running the bounded model checking uh, was automatic. So once we'd set up the environment, it's the same environment for all the bugs. Um, it takes anywhere from 20 minutes to seven hours, okay? And it found all of them. And this gives you a little bit of a, this drills down a little bit showing you the time. So for the processor core bugs, it found them quite quickly. And, one, and the reason is you only need to run bounded model checking on a single core to find these bugs. Right, so you, you have a smaller design and you can find them quickly. Uh, for the uncore bugs, it took a little bit longer, but still, um, it was still tractable. And power management bugs, uh, we can find those too. <clears throat> okay, um, and just another point here we ran, we basically ran symbolic QED with an initial state obtained uh, by running an FFT QED test. Uh, and I'll show you also some comparisons of. Uh, I think I'll show you, if not, I'll tell you a comparison of what happens if you run QED versus symbolic QED. Okay, um, now here's where the real magic happens, is the reduction in the bug trace. Okay, so if you run, uh, I'm not sure I actually have the resu results with comparing with QED. I don't. Okay, so let me just tell you. So if you, what we found is if you run uh, the original test like FFT or something else and just do end result checks, uh, basically what you get is, you know, millions of clock cycles and we found half of the bugs. Okay. If you run, if you now take the FFT test, use the QED transforms on it, uh, you find all the bugs. That's great. The error reduction, the error latency is reduced to something on the order of uh, 100 to 1,000 clock cycles. If you do the same, now if you take the same buggy design and run it through symbolic QED, it spits out a trace that is something like five instructions. Okay? So even if you got that 10,000 cycle trace from QED, it still would take a while to debug that. Uh, if, you've, if you're given a trace of five instructions, I mean, that's going to take you a few minutes, right? You can, you can use a waveform viewer, you can like trace through exactly what's going on, uh, and, and that really gives you uh, what you need to, to find these things quickly. Okay. Um, right, so, so yeah, this is comparing against the original end result checks, uh, just in more detail. So like I said, the original test found only half the bugs, small QD finds all the bugs, the number of cycles is something like, you know, on the order of 1 to 10 million, and the number of cycles for symbolic QED is on the order of 10 to 30. All right, so happy engineers. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's uh, just to summarize, then what we have with with QED and symbolic QED is a set of techniques for finding bugs, both pre and post silicon, uh, drastically improving the error detection latency, uh, giving you shorter uh, error traces that you can debug quickly. And um, this works for, for all kinds of bugs, core, uncore, et cetera. The QED technique, of course, works for electrical bugs, post silicon. Symbolic QED technique that I presented today is only for logic bugs, but we, we have a work in progress uh, for how you might adapt that to even help find uh, the electrical bugs post silicon. All right, and I'll stop there and take any questions. I'm surprised you didn't say that we, we put, inserted 92 bugs and found 114 because what are the odds that there's not? 14 other bugs in the hot part, in that design. Right, so we actually were hoping to find some unknown bug in OpenSpark. Um, we ran symbolic QED up to a window, I think, of like 50 cycles, and we didn't. We didn't find any. So I guess OpenSpark is a pretty thoroughly debugged design. Um, you know, it, it could be that there are still bugs in there, and, and maybe if we, we didn't use any diversity here, right? So. You could do symbolic QED with diversity by having the QED module insert diversity as it transforms. Um, so yeah, there are some other things. You know, this is sort of a first proof of concept. Um, but yeah, I suspect that with a less vetted design, we would find something. Yeah. 
Yeah. So surely there are any number of less well-vetted designs in the world from people that might welcome your help in finding <laughs> bugs they don't already know about. Yeah. Um, We've been talking to a number of industry people who are interested in this. Yeah. Unfortunately, those buggy designs may have never survived. Yeah. <laughs> they might right. be old in the graveyard. Right. Yeah. So one one test we did want to try that we didn't was maybe going back, you know, taking like revision histories and looking at old buggy designs. Um, but I think the bugs there probably are are less difficult to find than the ones we inserted. So I think we would find them, yeah. I remember way back talking to both Intel and Sun about design tools and flavor or whatever. Generally, maybe you should turn the camera on, but anyway. <laughs> Sun's, Sun's design, had few, they found fewer errors. And I mean, that, they were, their designs were so good that they earned the hardware, whatever checking they did afterwards, they didn't find too many bugs. Uh -huh. Because the Intel fit find a lot. So they're very happy with those tools. <laughs> yeah. Gives you a few hints. But like Sibish said, was time ago. Was these these time days ago. nobody's nobody's not finding bugs, right? Because the complexity is just yeah, enormous. Is. Yeah. Well, they have those young designers, they don't have those old gray hairs like We should have asked me. Um, the Martin sort of mentioned that the the old lock step or do, redundant computation stuff with a little diversity was that sort of proto QED in the sense that what I'm they're different you just don't know why mm -hmm. so was it possible they were detecting bugs and just writing it off as something else because um. you were doing duplicate computation frequent checks deep inside hardware back when they, I believe the frame phrase when Intel was not bigger than IBM, it, IBM was saying mainframe quality processors as opposed to those toys. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that there are a number of inspirations for QED and some things that are similar. I think what's really been done here is to sort of systematize it and, and you know. No, no, I'm not saying yeah. it was testing, I'm yeah. saying that they were just finding finding discrepancies, run it off of something else, and yeah. never realized what the, it was in a bug. Yeah. Instead, called, called it a temporary fault. <laughs> actually, I had a, okay. an even more gray hair coming. Mike Flynn, I asked him about it. Actually, that's how it started. And he designed the floating point unit for the IBM C6071, I believe, or whatever. 91. Something. What? 91. 91, sorry. Uh, and he basically knew about numeric analysis. So he had algebraic tests, basically, to, which are the digital, the analog, if you wish, or the integer version mm -hmm. of parity. That's the reason I, I mentioned parity before. The, yeah. the point is, you can do higher order parity. The highest order is essentially majority voting. Mm -hmm. So you can have a whole complete spectrum. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of other great techniques. And in fact, Intel has some very uh, good um, formal people. Uh, and they do, they do some things actually with higher order theorem proving, where they, where they take, and, and particularly for their floating point stuff, they're actually able to you know, come up with a, an algebraic model, prove that against sure. some, an intermediate model, and then prove that against the actual RTL. They have, you know. I, some of that work is really, sure, that, really great. That's obvious in the algebraic context. But yeah. it, and that's, yeah. I didn't mention might yeah. before, but yeah. the, there are digital equivalents. You said satisfiability. Mm -hmm. What does it really mean? Um, uh, well, <laughs> I think I should make one more bad joke. So, but your QED, you, you know there's also another meaning of QED. Mm -hmm. Quantum electrodynamics, mm -hmm. quantum computing if you wish. Mm -hmm. They have something more reasonable than that. That's called tensor networks. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they use a singular value decomposition to get close. Turns out there's a Boolean equivalent to that. Mm -hmm. Because what, what is satisfiability? It's such a question about can it be inverted? Mm -hmm. Because if, if the logic, any input and output, would be invertible, that's obvious. But obviously, most of our circuits are not. Although they typically have. How about, and Gamal told me about it. the number of typical inputs of any logic block is like the square root of number of outputs. So mm -hmm. having more outputs, it's much more likely to make it invertible. Mm -hmm. At that point, you can basically use these invertibility properties. Mm -hmm. Then you can do it much more systematically, even for the logic. Mm 
The fun part is that's what's happening implicitly in quantum computing, except they don't know that they're still going to run off on their own targets. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the satisfiability engines that we're using here are, um, you know, they're quite sophisticated. So we use the uh, Mentor Graphics engine, and the reason we use that is because uh, I was actually involved in developing that engine a long time ago, and it was uh, part of zero in-design automation. Um, my advisor was David Dill. We worked together on that. Uh, but they they have hired, you know, I know that team, and they have, you know, really good people who are up on the very latest satisfiability techniques. So it's actually, you know, that in and of itself, just the satisfiability engine is quite a, a marvel of technology. So we, we're trying to leverage that as much as possible. Except most of these people don't know anything about physics, so they never learned... The, the QED tricks that are around in there. Uh -huh. Basically, QED by inherently as invertible operators. Right. And that can be mapped back down to, to ordinary logic. Cool. Uh, I'm thinking that one of the ways the military is criticized is they say that generals are constantly fighting the previous war. Yeah. You know, after after, when you after, you, the gray head. after you've gone through something and you know that a possibility exists, you get really good at rediscovering that possibility. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent are you? Might your system be especially well suited at finding the sorts of bugs you yourself can already envision, mm -hmm. as opposed to the sorts of bugs that nobody we'll see coming until they've been found, and then you'll right. discover that your tools fail to take that into account. So I, I actually would be quite interested in exploring that question, because what, so I, what I like about this technique is it's very general, right? It will catch, it will basically tell you if there is any QED test that could fail. So the question is, what are the kinds of bugs that cannot be caught by a QED test of some reasonable size, right? So it, it could fail in a couple of ways. One is, that for some reason, uh, you know, this, this duplicate and duplicate and check with diversity still misses it, right? And what is the class of bugs that that might miss? I, I think that's an excellent research question. And then the other thing is, what are the classes of bugs that are only found where the minimum QED test is really, really long, right? That would be another class of bugs that, that we would have difficulty finding. So, you know, what I would love to do is go partner with a real design team and shake out a bunch of bugs. First of all, I think it's, this is a very general technique. I think it's going to shake out a lot of bugs. Uh, and once you once you're able to run this up to like unrolls of a hundred, and you don't find any bugs, you know, I'm, I'm I'd be pretty happy. But then I'd be really interested in knowing what came out after that, right? What are we missing? And then how could you improve this technique? Uh, and I, I think sort of a you know in the trenches approach would be a good way to to try to understand that problem. Just a quick comment on that. Uh, my parody, and I owe the parody example. It's the simplest I can imagine, but it's not the most practical. Also, not the most insightful, whatever. But there are other equivalents. Mm -hmm. As I said, the, the other extreme is like Mike Flynn's arithmetic, but again, you know, that's very limited. To mm -hmm. Typical digital systems these days, people cannot imagine any math that has anything to do with that, so the mm -hmm. typical approaches don't really help you. But they're out there, definitely. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well. Processor clock because of the propagation so delays to the logic analyzers and back. The, the, the answer is all of the above, right? Because first they would run real time, but then when they will find that uh, that there would be there would be a problem. For example, there is a hang. I will show you some you know real examples very soon. Then what do you do? You know that's when you try to slow down, you try to deconfigure and all that. But guess what? A lot of these bugs are what software guys would call Heisenbugs, because once you have slowed something down or deconfigured something, the bug is gone, right? So it's a it's a it's a it's a nightmare you know to deal with. I will I will show some actual examples. Uh, the of that, the uh, picture's actually sorry. missing half the cables coming out of the logic analyzer. Which is an e there seems to be an equal number of Ethernet cables going somewhere. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's right, you know. So it's into the, <laughs> to the cloud, you know. <laughs> okay. And if you thought that was a problem at the chip level and the chip guys have to deal with it, here is actually a plot from Cisco. So what does Cisco do? So they either build their own ASICs 
or they buy ASICs from other vendors and they build large systems, right? And when their customers complain that some system is not working, well, the first thing they have to do is to find out which chip is not working, right? Before they can go and do anything else. And you don't have to really read these histograms. Bottom line, what it is saying is that up to 60% of the situations, they end up identifying the incorrect chip to be the bad chip. Forget about trying to even figure out what in the world is going wrong. So the problem, this problem gets even magnified at the system level, okay? So what do we do about it? So, you know, so we sort of have to solve this problem. So I always tell my students, I say that, you know, like, so this problem looks like an impossible problem. And why would, you know, somebody in academia try to solve an impossible problem? Some sort of sounds like an industrial problem and so on. So I always tell my students that when there is a problem which looks impossible, that means that we really do not understand what the problem is, right? So we have to really understand what is the real problem here. And we have figured out what the real problem is. And I believe, and I have enough evidence by now, right? But if you look at the number of bugs that escape during design and show up during pre-silicon, uh, during post-silicon validation, that's shooting up. And that knee of this curve that you see, that was sort of around the time that you know uh, multi-core chips were introduced. So you can see the massive complexity over here. So clearly the pre-silicon verification that we do today is inadequate. And if you thought that was bad, I think things are going to get much worse. And that's because the chips and systems that we build today, they are facing some major obstacles, many walls simultaneously. All of you know about the power wall, right? That's why you cannot go to Fry's Electronics and buy a 10 gigahertz microprocessor. Now, why is that important you know, in this context of complexity? This is a reason. The reason that you cannot go and buy a 10 gigahertz microprocessor, that has to do with fundamental physics, which is called the Denard scaling of uh, you know, transistors. But now, when the transistors are not getting better from an energy efficiency standpoint, but my mom wants a better computer, a better cell phone, which means that the world needs high performance systems. The only way to get performance, and by performance I just don't mean speed, I mean energy efficiency and all that. The only way to achieve performance when the technology is not getting better is by embracing a lot of complexity. And that's exactly what's happening today and that's why you are seeing uh, these accelerators, these multiple cores, you know, power management, thermal management, and you name it. And as a result of this massive complexity, this verification and the problem of bugs gets very significantly difficult, okay? So what do we do about it? Well, you know, what does the industry do today? Well, you know, so when these chips you got back from the foundry, what would you do? Well, you know, you plug it into the system. And I literally know of companies that play games on these systems because games sometimes tend to expose bugs that you would not otherwise find, right? And if you are lucky, you are going to see the blue screen of death. If you are not, not, not lucky, your customers are going to see that. And just consider yourself you know, st sitting in front of that blue screen, staring at it, and trying to find out that which one of the billions of transistors that are there inside that chip just caused a little error in which ones of the trillions or quadrillions of cycles that thing was running. So that you can actually go and tell you know, which part of the chip is not working, and you know, that's called localization. And then you have to root cause and fix your problem and it keeps going on and on. And if you look at the numbers from industry, you will find that it takes weeks or months of manual work per bug, right? So that's crazy. So why is that so? The reason is that the existing techniques are completely ad hoc. Now for those of you that are wondering you know, what this is, uh, this, 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 this picture was shared by my friend, you know, Jason Stinson, who used to be at Intel, and he used to do a lot of this validation stuff. He used to be a very senior guy, and, you know, but essentially what's going on, this is a very high-end validation system. What's happening is that you actually cannot see the chip, which is sort of sitting somewhere over here, right? You cannot see it. Now, uh, who can tell me what these windows are? You can see those windows, you know, over uh, there in the picture. There's, some, there's data collection behind them. Yeah, those are logic analyzers, basically, right? And all these things that you are seeing, these are actually cables 
that are connecting the, uh, the pins of the chip uh, into those logic analyzers with the hope that somebody will, you know, like collect all this information and be able to figure out what the heck is going wrong, you know, with that chip, right? You know, what caused that blue screen? So essentially, clearly this is not a scalable way of doing things and as a result, uh, the post silicon costs are rising faster than the design cost. Yes? This isn't, in a system of this sort, with this complexity, that much hardware and so forth, is this being tested at real time or is it necessary to slow down the main process? Accelerators like GPUs and DSPs and so on, it has mixed signal components and it has a whole bunch of other components that Intel, if you were from Intel, you would call it the uncore, which means everything that's outside the core. And that would be like power management, memory controllers, network controllers, you name it. So that's the beast that, you know, we must make sure that it works, right? And guess what? What's really going on in industry is that uh, you can have all sorts of new architectural features that you can think about, right? If you an, are an architect, you can have all sorts of new designs that you can think about to solve uh, the energy efficiency problem, to improve performance and so on and so forth. The only trouble is that you won't be able to verify that whether your techniques actually work and as a result, it won't see the light of the day. So here is a quote from uh, my friend Ian Young. Uh, he's a senior fellow at Intel and he said that new architectural features are limited by validation. And if you thought this was bad, look at this chart. So this is a very simplified cartoon a uh, picture of, you know, uh, how chips are built. So you do a design and while you design, you write the Verilog or something and then you do what is called pre-silicon verification to just make sure that this uh, design doesn't have bugs. Oops, there you go. No, we don't want to install. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, you send the chips to be built by the foundry and, <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, postpone. Sorry. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, the chips are built by the foundry and the chips come back from the foundry. You know, you do a little, you know, post silicon validation and bring up and then, you know, you have high volume of chips that, you know, go out to the customers. Now, guess what? This is a chart from Intel and I often joke that how do you tell that a chart is from Intel when there are no numbers on, you know, uh, on any of the axes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. And, you know, uh, uh, Professor Clark Barrett, who is my collaborator on this project. Clark and I, we are going to talk about how to achieve dramatic improvements in uh, validation and debug for system on chips. And uh, the scheme that we will be using is called QED and symbolic QED. Now, uh, it's a loaded term. QED really stands for quick error detection. That's what I'm going to talk about. But we have another motive, which is once you know you use this QED technique to uh, validate your chips, you would say, "Well, you know this chip works." End of proof. QED, right? So, uh, uh, so um, of course, you know uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm presenting the work, but uh, all this work has been done by the students and the collaborators, so they deserve the credit. You know, we are just here uh, to present their work. So we know that there is an explosive growth in our dependency on electronic systems. You know, I was at a meeting of the National Academy, uh, you know, like last year, and they were talking about these, you know, societal uh, scale problems, right? You know, water, world hunger, education, and all that. And everybody said that the only way to solve that pro those problems is through information technology, right? And that's something that I felt very proud of because I work in that space. But guess what? When you're going to plant electronics inside your body to monitor and actuate and do all sorts of things, you do not want that thing to just crash, right? Which means that if we really have to achieve that, we must ensure robust operation, right? Now, if you look at chips today, on the other hand, there is a staggering complexity of integrated circuits. It's no longer just, you know, talking about some processors and that's it. This is an SOC or a system on a chip, and you see that it has a whole bunch of stuff. It has 
a bunch of processors it has 